wish you stay where you are. Give your eyes a moment to adjust to the darkness. Symbolically, this sentence represents the whole campaign experience. Its very heart and its outer rim. From its setting to its final act, World at War forms an experience where the outcome of every action is pure ugliness. It creates a world where heroism and villainy both result in an unfiltered carnage. And unless you run through its levels as if it was Duke Nukem, you're going to have to make your eyes and your stomach adapt to its very literal, historically very real ugliness of torn limbs, hanged doubters, burnt flesh and merciless revenge. The absence of light, that impenetrable curtain outside the cave, through a process of symbolic transmutation came to represent a wide range of hideousness, both metaphysical and natural. The word darkness is a metaphorical vessel used to describe and capture concepts and phenomena often too vague, too complex or plain ugly for a single mind or culture to accept and absorb in its raw form. The word is a patchy net we cast onto our deep existential fears of the indifferent and invisible wheel of fate and history that had crushed so many trying to hold at least some sense of definition and the illusion of control through familiarity. Even the vaguest name gives the horror at least some shape. In World at War we don't get to see the primordial darkness of the fireless age, nor the incarnation of evil, but we experience human predicament that's as far from the symbolic representation of light as the very word darkness promises, as a word and as a symbol. A war might seem like a rather material event in its nature, and not in need of a complex metaphor. But the level of destruction, individual suffering, the looming ideology and its symbols, and the sheer scale of death and its industrial quality almost seem to give the phenomenon an unnatural aspect. More than two million Soviets alone are to this day considered as missing in action. Contemplate all those bodies swallowed up by forests and earth, as if swallowed by a passing wave of darkness. Carnage and slaughterhouse seem too specific and don't possess the implication of scale. Tragedy is too poetic with its desperate reliance on catharsis. Darkness is truly the most concrete and vaguest term at the same time to describe this horror, the extent of its savagery, the scale of its madness, the very light of hell. For the entire duration of the campaign, you are going to inhabit a space devoid of hope. It is a world of an immense darkness, decomposed into its basic elements and held together by a war. There's an important distinction in the manner in which World at War explores its theme. First person shooter is an umbrella term under which gathers a strange crowd. What I'm particularly aiming at is the depiction of war in video games. First person shooters have been the leading medium of the interactive intimate depiction of war. And yet most of these games are action games. They primarily explore the excitement of interactive shooting. War is merely a visual backdrop, a flavor, an excuse for action. Its conflict supports what little story there is and tries to round the whole experience with a motivation for all the action. This is the sad burden and legacy of shooters, that they rarely go beyond shooting itself. And scripting mostly supports Hollywood-inspired action, rarely a thematic examination of war. Modern Warfare, Black Ops, Ghosts and the rest are all action games by the very fact that they don't depict war as a central theme. Instead they use wars as a backdrop for their stories and action. And amidst all the shooting they show little of actual war. By this standard, Metro or Warcraft are more of a war game in the sense that they explore the phenomenon of war more than most Call of Duty titles. World at War is a game that made the distinction for me. I really like the skyscraper segment in Ghosts, but I'm always conscious of the fact that this is just a cool variation of the old shooting mechanic. In World at War I feel like I'm experiencing war and not the shooting loop itself. Shooting loop is just a direct manifestation of that war and it is utilized to that effect. All around you, through the coercion of other design elements, World at War forces you to inhabit war itself, not just its thrilling action-packed moments. 
Among the particular design elements that made this game feel like an experience of war, one of the most important for me is the consistency of the framing device. Unlike the great architect's perspective of the strategy games that examine the war on a wholly different level and scale, the framework of the experience in World at War is the intimacy of a pair of boots, represented through hands. You are never just a camera catching a fancy shot, you are always a soldier, never out of avatar. This grounds the experience in to a single vessel. Everything that happens from action to thematic exploration is experienced through it. This gives the whole experience an organic and immersive feel. Once your experience is so tightly defined, your control is meaningful. What you do and where you look isn't just a part of the experience, it is the experience. Controlling the avatar's perspective is a direct, most immediate response to your input. You have control during the intermissions and the lack of traditional cutscenes makes the whole experience organic. I still remember how visceral that execution scene felt and it holds the same weight for me to this day, precisely because it doesn't happen as a cutscene, but a matter of fact of the world I inhabit at that moment. It is all the more brutal because it's incidental and grounded and doesn't break the connection between the player and the setting. Those uniform cuffs that frame the wrists are chains and you will not escape this world until there is no more game to play. Thematic exploration happens around you as you play, and a sense of both participation and control is created, as opposed to having it all shoved down your throat in an expositional dump in a cutscene. World at War puts you in the shoes of both a witness and a perpetrator. It shows you the ugliness of war from the most uncomfortable perspective, with control. This is why it works so well. It doesn't separate themes from interactivity, while designing the gameplay that actually explores those themes. It pairs thematic consistency with organic exploration of the theme, environments, scenarios, art style. They determine this experience as much as the shooting loop itself, because you are directly involved in them. It trusts the medium enough to deliver these experiences, these close-ups of ugliness, with an uninterrupted flow. This creates a feeling that you are part of something. This isn't just a brutal portrayal of war, it's an experience of that brutality. Vintage shooters have hardly developed themes beyond mere imagery and imitation of the battles of the Second World War. They are considerably more complex and layered variations of the Wolfenstein formula, with stories of bravery and camaraderie, but rarely a subject that's specifically explored, let alone a higher concept. Modern Warfare was about capturing the excitement of limbs in action. The aesthetic experience was daring and edgy, but with little thematic substance. It was an action game. War was merely a visual backdrop. This is not the case with World at War. The appeal and legacy of this campaign is its focus, its utter dedication to the exploration of the brutality of war. This theme permeates the rest of the design elements to a whole new level of consistency, connecting everything into a singular experience, from dirt under the fingernails to the conflict between characters. All elements are supporting pillars to the crowning theme of brutality of war. When I say all, I hardly exaggerate. Late war setting, brutal introductions of protagonists, grim scripted events, gory combat, moral conflict. There's hardly an element that doesn't add to the overall sense of brutality, directly or implicitly. Even that ominous music upon booting the game promised that this was going to be a different kind of experience. Wars are complex anthropological phenomena and combat is just their final extension. Besides examining combat, World at War brings a broader sense of brutality as well. Not just brutality of action, but of condition. And it manages to cramp in their tales of survival, revenge and moral conflict. This game examines war beyond mere shooting loop. Instead of simply celebrating the mechanical representation of war and its thrill and theatricality, mechanics are used to support the overarching theme of the game. Shooting loop is still the core, you progress and complete objectives through it, but elements around it truly elevate the experience. It's not just about individual acts of violence and suffering, it's the scope of it. This was the first game to show the ugly face of the industrial warfare, our ingenuity in building tools of destruction. What I take from this game is the realization of conditions that ordinary people went through, 
This is because World at War manages to intimize Carnage and make it relatable. And it feels like a very contained, rounded experience. Call of Duty World War II falls short with its depiction of Holocaust, reducing it to empty beds where horror once resided. It trusts its audience with the power of an automatic weapon, but it doubts their capacity to handle history. It wastes a talented team and millions of dollars on a train chase, but doesn't dare to show you rib cages protruding under the skin. All of this has been said and shown in books and films for centuries, but interactivity does one scary thing. It pulls us closer to the subject. We get to experience that thing that human mind has been contriving and describing for centuries, trying to pry a foreboding image from the darkness of trepidation. It flushes before us this esoteric vision, a near-universal image of a dread that ignores time and space, this ancient primordial omen that there's something sinister in the very nature of the reality of our existence, that thing that humanity has erected out of its most animalistic fear and its most human despair. It shows us hell. World at War had a firmly established framework of a first-person shooter and a Call of Duty game, and these restraints and rules are obvious when you play the game, but it had managed to create a unique aesthetic identity through the thematization of its setting. In order to support the theme of brutality of the war, developers chose the closing days of the two of its particularly brutal theaters. This is crucial for the experience that the game ended up being. They could have depicted brutal combat of any setting, but the sense of finality at the tips of your fingers is what adds unique momentum to both the story and the gameplay. There's also the universally recognizable symbolism and the staggering scale of destruction that's hard to match with the same potency even in fictional settings. Both theaters are visually distinctive, strongly defined through their immediate landscape of wilderness and confined urban areas. Pacific Islands are small kingdoms of sand, trees and rock. There are less traces of human effort in general, less symbolic representations of ideologies, and with nature as the backdrop for violence, the whole theater has a much more Darwinian feel to it. While Berlin is a smoldering, ash-coated ruin of a city, full of symbols to be destroyed. Apart from being completely different from each other in terms of look and atmosphere, these two settings serve two distinct purposes. Pacific Islands bring the unique tension of having to face Japanese guerrilla tactics on a difficult terrain, while Berlin levels bring a moral conflict and poetization of war through Reznov's theatricality. World at War fleshes out some of the psychology behind the last days of war and different motivations. The Soviets capturing Berlin and Reichstag building is a symbolic fight. They're going to win, that's obvious. With the Germans, it's more complex. Why are they fighting a war that's already lost? Fear of retaliation, fanaticism, fulfillment of an oath. Sadly, the game doesn't really examine their motivation, nor does it offer any unique mechanics that would represent the complex psychology behind their impulse to keep fighting until the bitter end. What's particularly distinctive and memorable are the models of the soldiers. Their uniforms are dirty, their hands are scratched, their faces bruised and bloodied, some are heavily bandaged, and some display iron crosses on their uniform. Utility poles and trees around Reichstag are decorated with the corpses of hanged traitors. Together with the world design itself, these details help paint the picture of an imminent downfall. Japanese models also have some nuanced details, such as Hatsimaki headbands worn as a sign of courage, camouflage and katanas on officers. Each of those iron crosses is a small story from the past when nobody even thought about something as wild as a last stand in the Reichstag. There are several scripted events that highlight the unique intensity of those last days of battle, such as German soldiers desperately trying to keep the Soviets from entering one of the hallways, retreating through the streets before the shrinking ring of steel and flesh, or desperately trying to escape through the woods. In Pacific levels, this is countered with ambushes, banzai charges and kamikaze attacks. You get two unique experiences in one game. The fate of the war has already decided itself through the unseen coercions of countless threads in the web of strategy 
strategy and circumstance. It isn't just that you know the ultimate outcome of the Battle of Berlin and now you get to experience its details. More importantly, you witness the futility of deaths in those last moments before the inevitable downfall as both sides are fighting purely symbolic battles. The fight for Reichstag is particularly ironic since you're basically fighting for a ruin and burnt swastika flags, falling statues, desperate soldiers, these are all fitting symbols of a crumpling empire. You are literally at the end of an era. You see its symbols destroyed as you progress towards what is made to look like the last soldier of the Reich. German soldiers standing behind an MG42 somewhere in Russia feels as if there is a thick red line at the edge of that barrel, a line that envelops an empire behind its back. He feels like a beating heart of that expanding empire. The one in the hallway of the Reichstag feels like behind him there are a couple of precious square meters upon which to draw your last breath. Chronologically, they made a bit of a mess and failed to point out the fact that the war itself actually ended on the 2nd of September, months after the fall of Berlin. Blowtorch and Corkscrew takes place 14 days after Hitler's suicide and 6 days after Germany's unconditional surrender. There's actually a photograph of US soldiers listening to the radio reports on Germany's surrender and their faces tell it all. For them, the war is far from over. These two general settings lead to some very specific set pieces. Voracious jungle, feudal castle, crumbling apartment buildings and dark metros. Out of all the atmospheric levels in Berlin, the haunting hallways of an abandoned asylum are particularly memorable. The city has been gutted open and reveals both private living spaces and public institutions. The inner workings of a German society have become a battlefield. Reznov's promise came true. This is a masterful act of juxtaposition. Years ago Reznov was remembering how a local restaurant in Stalingrad was once brimming with joy and laughter as the fire that's slowly devouring that very restaurant lit his thought-absorbed face. And then years and kilometers later, you're standing in someone's kitchen in Berlin. You are going through the heart of the city. Its broken clockwork lies open before you. You're passing through rooms where working class and Nazi intelligentsia used to social fighting in the streets where the bustle of life was emitting culture. It is the most violent of intrusions when you produce that clanking sound of a machine gun's mechanism on a street corner where neighbors were greeting each other. Soviets gave them the opportunity to feel what it's like to actually fight for your homeland instead of some contrived Lebensraum fantasy. That stark difference between conquest and existential combat. The battleground for their ideology has shrunk to the very heart of its origin. Streets of Berlin are ironically where it's going to lose, not some distant field of an occupied territory. Petrenko's journey is particularly symbolic. He crawls out of a mass grave inside a dry fountain, which is in itself a symbol of utter destruction of a city, and ends up on the roof of the Reichstag. In my previous video I've praised the coup section in modern warfare, but not many settings can give you such a distinctive and grandiose journey. How incomprehensibly bizarre it is that Petrenko, a baker or a steel factory worker who lived somewhere in the Soviet Union, gained access to the very room where Hitler had declared the war to the United States. Look at the colorized image of that particular moment. That otherworldly eagle. It radiates with brazen power. The act itself didn't actually happen in the Reichstag, but in the Kroll Opera House opposite the parliament building. Reichstag itself wasn't actually in use since the fire in 1933, but both the point and the effect are still there. Pacific islands are distinctive and atmospheric, but Berlin levels take the spotlight in this game. One of the most unexpected feelings I have is how apocalyptic its atmosphere and visuals feel. Beautiful architecture, when in ruins, preserves some of the original beauty, but adds to it a disturbing, somewhat poetic aspect. A new kind of beauty. The order and precision of the lines and forms adopt the chaos of random destruction of shells and shrapnel while Vendetta is a post-mortem autopsy of a city in a rigor mortis. Eviction is an anatomy class on a living specimen. The sight of mangled armature blossoming out of torn concrete is the recurring visual motif in this game. Streets are barricaded with cupboards and furniture. Personal belongings have become instruments of defense, an unforeseen aspect of the national socialism. You walk through a ruined library. Industry books and high literature burn equally bright. 
Battle for Berlin seems like the ultimate act of voyeurism. The very prospect of it, attacking the parliament building full of desperate, abandoned and betrayed soldiers who know that this will be their end, feels like the ultimate last stand. It takes a lot of momentum in the form of emotions, historic significance and symbolism to create such a momentum in the story, and the World at War setting still provides that momentum. To me, this is one of those moments where history just surpasses any fiction. It's April 30th, afternoon the day Hitler shot himself, and when you plant that flag on top of the Reichstag, his body lies less than a kilometer away in a shallow ditch. Just being aware of that fact adds something to the experience and makes me value even more the chance to inhabit this setting. The style of intro vignettes is a balance between real-life wartime instructional videos and the modernized presentation from the modern warfare. World at War had really managed to represent the scope of an industrial war in a dramatic fashion through these briefing sequences. Surprisingly, archive footage blends in with custom graphics rather well and is ultimately far more dynamic, dramatic and informative than what we've seen before. Strategic feel from all the war maps, contrasted with poetic narration, creates a rather unique blend of elements. Especially memorable is the contrast between grayscale footage and stark colors, particularly that blood red. The intro itself is worthy of a top dollar HBO opening sequences. Conquered territory is appropriately represented in the stark red. Documentary footage of death and destruction is shown over a chilling soundtrack. When 13 red stripes of the US flag turn into steady flows of black oil, their smooth surface reflecting two symmetrical rows of pump jacks, this highlights the background of any war, the productivity of the system that controls the means of production. Those pump jacks are the lungs of the war. The intro is sharply cut and the integration of Roosevelt's declaration of war into the fast-paced transitions of footage and graphics is more iconic and memorable than the original video itself, because it juxtaposes the president of the world's great greatest military power with people whose labor actually constitutes that power. In the original, it's just politicians surrounding another politician. It offers a summary of what it might have felt like for a country to enter a war on a psychological level. That sense that you're part of history in the making in some abstract manner. Tank assembly line is particularly memorable for me. The whole series works towards building up that intimidating aura around tanks. Their presence is unmistakable, ordinary weapons don't do any damage, and they always give an upper hand, and then you see them being assembled as if they were toys. I find that so bizarre for some reason, that somebody works 12 hour shifts welding stuff and then that stuff is what makes the difference between life and death on a field somewhere. And the last shot is particularly ominous. Skinny back of a volunteer in a doctor's office merges into a 3D model of a soldier, equipped with grenades and a rifle, a backpack and a helmet. And as he aims the gun, the player's perspective reverse slides through the sights into the eye of Private Miller. From a president through tomboy Helen the Welder, the war effort offers you the final extension of its economy and ideology. A nation puts forward the manifestation of its will, and this person has no idea what horrors await him. The intro sequence to Hard Landing is such a brilliant blend of graphic design and editing that you don't have time for anything else except to feel overwhelmed. Ball chain is ripped off from Sullivan's dog tags and from that point visual elements start to move, rotate and dissolve into each other, painting a picture of the war with each move. From a close-up of Sullivan's death mask, to a sight of a closing casket, to a space full of identical caskets all merging into stars of the US flag, moving through saluting soldiers to a thousand yard stare on Roebuck's face whose eye dissolves into a map of the island where mission is to take place. Introduction to Vendetta has the camera swerve through the footage of Nazi atrocities throughout the Slavic lands and then skydives into the fountain of death in the street map of Stalingrad's grid work. You get the visual summary of the extermination campaigns in the east and one of the lowest starting points in the gaming history. One image in particular bears a great symbolic potency and is a testament to the power of juxtaposition. Before you emerges a giant iron cross, German military decoration dating back to the times of the Prussian Empire. Now a miserable coat of arms of the crumpling empire cult. Its basic yet effective design is the symbol of the steel will of those who were to conquer the world. Under its arms we see real-life images of the remains of the Nazi Germany, boys, old men and the broken soldiers. After gallons of spilled blood, this is what an ideology of fanaticism has brought them to. Not a sign of the glorious future, no sophistry about racial purity, humans reduced to their biological shell, framed by a faint notion of nationality. 
those idealized faces from propaganda posters with stares that span centuries of glory and prosperity are nowhere in sight. This is what a promise of the thousand year empire has been reduced to. A stare doubting tomorrow will even happen. Breaking Point creates these informative collages that highlight the ultimate price that soldiers pay. It feels like a dreadful conclusion to war. What I find particularly appealing about the introduction segments of each mission is how they don't just lead into the shooting loop, instead they weave together a story, support the core team and flesh out personalities and relationships between characters. It's never just pure style or exposition, but visuals and narrative densely merge together. They contain the essence of both the general setting and the specific level and are an immersive gateway into the atmosphere and themes of the game. There's less movement compared to modern warfare, but intros themselves are more seamlessly integrated into the immediate story. Action is slower and it brings tension and suspense rather than thrill and excitement. Introductions are really important in a sense that they reveal so much of the level's aesthetic in a single fade-in. So many games have tutorials as an introduction to their mechanics and worlds. The list is perhaps unnecessarily long. World at War's idea of an introduction is almost having your throat slit in the first minute of the game. This is the only tutorial you get. What an appropriate training for the Pacific Theater. It's not just that we've all played so many shooters and that their controls are already intuitive to a degree, on top of not being too complex in the first place. And it's not even how boldly it disregards the idea of a tutorial. It's what it offers instead. This captured state is your first interactive moment. The turn of the head is the complete extent of your control. The framing and the rhythm of the scene are masterful. The laconic Japanese officer has the whole thing under control, doesn't mind turning his back to you. Pile is being tortured in front of you and Cook is being slapped outside a hut. They have a small setup and are comfortable in their violence. The way Pyle's face looks and how tightly his hands are bound behind his back is a detail that immerses you into helplessness of the situation. His whole lower face is covered in blood. He clenches his fist while the officer puts out a cigarette in his eye. Both the officer and the soldier have very measured and restrained movement compared to a similar scene later in the game, where German soldiers are much more expressive in their violence. This gives an uncanny rhythm to this torture. Officer lifts Pyle's head with the side of his index finger while holding the cigarette with it. He doesn't care to take the cigarette in the other hand or hold it in the corner of his mouth. But Pyle has made his peace and he's ready to die, so an act of defiance is the only possible expression. Officer takes a deep puff, pauses for a second staring into Pyle's eyes, all the while holding him by his hair, and then extinguishes the cigarette in his eye. These actions are partially obscured but are ominously mirrored in the play of shadows on the wall. A dismissive jerk of the arm is the final judgment. An obedient bow, a crouch, an expression of satisfaction in the moment of taking a life, a dismissive push with a boot, a cut actually appears across Pyle's throat and is the culmination of this intense experience. The whole scene rests on a very specifically crafted pathos of violence. Miller. Out of all the depictions of an amphibious assault, this is the only one that shows the beginning of the action. And this sets it apart on multiple levels. Shadows absorb their facial features and folds of their uniforms. An immense entity of the blinding light seeps into the bowels of the ship. You cross the line between the world of shadow and light. And in this game, daylight only reveals more darkness. Night at least obscures it. First few seconds are promising. Attack planes fly above your head and navy barrages dig over the beach. But the presence of an opposing will on the island is soon manifested. As landing crafts become coffins, you can't do much except observe. A falling airplane slices through the air right in front of you. You're seeing consequences of someone on the island stepping on a AA gun paddle or pulling a cannon string. It's as simple and as bizarre as that. What a theater of violence and destruction you're thrown in. Out of the metallic safety of the ship's womb, you're cast into the world that holds so many possible variations of death. The whole sequence is particularly rhythmic and tension just keeps on rising as you get stuck on the coral as Private loses a piece of his skull, until it's ultimately resolved with a detonation knocking you out into the ocean. By the time you mount your bayonet and start moving towards the beach, the anticipation is at its peak, but instead of a fight you're faced with a field full of ugly consequences of your radio call, all under a tender blue sky that would make a nice desktop wallpaper.
As the very earth trembles from the bomber planes above, the game introduces a massacre framed by a dead face and an open palm. You and Reznov are camouflaged by death itself, in a fountain turned mass grave. It is only fitting to have a fountain change its role from a city decoration to a grave as a symbolic representation of the bloodiest battle in history. If they used the real life statue of six children dancing around a crocodile, the effect would be much greater. Crows are picking flesh, German soldiers are casually executing the wounded. The landscape of a city turned into an ashtray consumes your whole perspective. The air has a texture of metal and ash. It is a sight you have to soak in. Planes above, roaring tank besides. Uneven rhythm of the finishing shots. Persistent crows having a feast. Two soldiers on the tank, utterly unresponsive to the carnage. Blood trails soaked in by the gravel. Stiff faces staring into the sky. Flames bursting out of apartments. Columns of smoke dissolving into the air. The whole perspective is so dense with sorrow. Your first act of control is to crawl out of that pile of corpses. And I just can't think of anything to compare to this site. Before the screen is lifted, we hear distant sounds of combat, showing that there's a raging war around this isolated scene. As Petrenko, with his nasty tendency to get himself in tight spots, regains consciousness, we see before us a small stage with three actors. They themselves, as well as the scene as a whole, are the representation of the state of the Nazi Empire. Silo Heights are known as the Gates of Berlin. This is the last line of defense. Within two weeks, the war in Europe will effectively be over, but nobody can skip forward. There is more dying to be done. It's fair to say that these three had seen some tough fighting. One of them closes a pocket watch and hurries the other two. This one comments how the loot is just sentimental memorabilia reminding the soldiers of their home. Somehow they still believe they'll win. The scene is beautifully lit by a fireplace in the corner. It gives an ironic warmth to skin and cloth textures. Several rays of light are cast through the window onto a still life on a table. The scene still preserves that layer of an idyllic countryside life. I like how the slow and tired reach for the Mosin is matched by a quick turn of the head that meets the army boot. You distinctly see two rows of nails in the sole of his boot as they stamp your face. Through rays of sunlight and dirt particles, subtle balalaika notes introduce the very embodiment of cruelty and mercy. The beginning of eviction is particularly interesting. You're in a hallway of an apartment building where people used to live their ordinary lives. As you enter one of the rooms, you stumble upon a scene of a mock courtroom. In the pool of light sits a frightened German soldier. Around the spotlight is a circle of judge and jurors. There's a brief debate ongoing and as soon as you realize what's happening, soldier is mercilessly executed. It's a war crime nobody is ever going to mention. That soldier might have been a bug somebody stepped on. The war, its fleshy and metallic extension, its human manifestation, this wave of emotions and actions, doesn't stop for anyone. It doesn't care to contemplate the idealistic morality of not harming the unarmed man. It sweeps away forward. A war crime in the whirlwind of violence doesn't weigh down the collective conscience. You actually begin the last US mission with no ammo. That's hilarious. You're supposed to storm a castle and you have no ammunition. This paints a rather different image of war than most shooters do, but it tells a story and offers a glimpse into how it might have felt to stand there even for a second, holding a baseball bat with a complex mechanism inside of it. That clicking sound that yields no bang is so strange after all the exploding theaters you've been through. Japanese snipers wait for you to arrive at the ammo drop to shoot at you. They use your own ammo as bait. Pulled from another near-death experience, Petrenko catches his breath as Berlin burns and trembles around him. This isn't something that just shrugged off. Character closes and opens his eyes, gasps for air and actually needs a minute before standing up. For a brief moment over Reznov's shoulder, behind the barricades and two hanged German soldiers, you see a familiar building. There it is, the very heart of darkness. It is presented to you not in a dramatic way, but as a matter of fact, as any other building, a view that is a mere consequence of the city's layout. A recurring symbolic motif happens for the third and last time. Reznov hands you a gun and a fresh cycle of violence can begin. This is one of my favorite introductions. The whole screen trembles as the foundations of the building are shaken by the rockets. The fire-lit hallway extends before you. 
Each ceremonial element is coated with another aesthetic layer brought on by the war. Paintings are crooked, swinging chandeliers are extinguished, carpet is dirty and mangled. What the Commissar says is very much true. Remaining soldiers in the Reichstag put a fierce and bitter fight. It is a rather simple opening to a final mission, but the point of it is to show that the whole Eastern Front has been symbolically shrunk down to a city block. Scripting creates a denser feeling of war happening around you through mad choreography of violence and destruction. This is nothing new essentially, these snippets of choreographed action have existed in the original game as well and added fidelity to the overall depiction of war. But in World at War this aspect of the experience is elevated to a whole new degree of consistency. It scales down the death toll of combat to a more intimate struggle. These scripted moments are expanded to include not just more variety and nuance in representing war but more striking imagery as well and with more thematic and symbolic value. They portray a different kind of conflict compared to what we've seen before. World at War depicts executions of unarmed soldiers and acts of compassion. It shows cunning guerrilla tactics and pure physical struggle. It shows fanaticism, pain, suffering, harsh conditions, struggle for bare life. It constantly brings forth that image of two forces of life, two wills determined to live, opposing each other in an intimate embrace of death. After landing on the beach of one of the islands and heavy shelling initiated by yourself, you get to see the gruesome consequences of the act, presented organically as part of the world. No theatrics, no cutscenes, dismemberment, bizarre movement of the wounded. Robux simply says, put him down, and you can't tell if it's hatred or mercy. Black Cat's mission is full of such moments and feels incredibly alive and dynamic. It starts slow and it evolves into barely containable chaos. It feels like there's no time to blink. I really like that the time of day actually changes throughout the mission, giving you a sense of presence. This mission brings another level of chaos to the combat and shows how little of it is under the control of an individual. You see the utter madness of a kamikaze strike in a graveyard of US fleet, bleeding oil over water surface. You're following an attack plane with a trail of tracer rounds and in the corner of your perspective you catch a plane bursting into flames against the hull of a ship and metal parts flying off into the ocean. Kamikaze planes explode in flashes of fire fireballs and sparks. Pilots around you yell out different information. A cacophony of sound reverberates over water, and your turning perspective and senses capture in different degrees the individual sound of each fired bullet, each word and explosion, and your mind pieces together a puzzle out of each individual spark, splash of water or muzzle flash. Thick dark curls of smoke spiral out of the open metallic wounds and rise towards the sky. In the middle of all this you're out of bullets and become a mere spectator of this metallic carnage. When there's a scripted event in World at War it shows either destruction, death or the promise of the two. There are some particularly memorable and visceral moments in the campaign, when a piece of private skull flies off and you see actual damage, sign letters falling off a building as you cross the terrace, when tension of suspense explodes into ambush. Spontaneous executions of German captives rounded up against the wall and shot mercilessly. And all these little stories fit the overall atmosphere. The cumulative effect of these sequences, the aesthetic extract from the sediment of your gameplay experience, is a feeling that the war is an unprecedentedly destructive event, sweeping away human lives in its blindness, through a set of chaotic rules that favor no one. A mad broom pushing humans towards the gaping maw of death. In spite of all the edgy stuff from other Call of Duty titles, this is by far the grittiest, most viscerally brutal installment, the rawest of the experience. All of these scenes are little pieces in the mosaic of the overall atmosphere. The greatest casualties were towards the end of the war. That broken Axis machine was determined to waste so much life in a total war. And this game is largely an examination of that process. Playing through the Ring of Steel and Eviction you see what war does to civilization and culture. And this game gives so much of that bitter flavor to these scenes. Miserable command center inside a devastated kitchen is the ultimate deconstruction of military protocol and standard. Crooked landscape paintings in between torn walls show that this war has invaded the intimate space. And every level is brimming with such detail. Heavy bandages soaked in blood, some of them covering those blue Aryan eyes. That weary walk of a battle-worn soldier in the background of Stalingrad's massacre. Blood of your comrades on your shirt cuffs. A particularly young looking face model on a German soldier. An X mark engraved into the side of P-38 showing that this is a specimen captured by the Soviets. 
Japanese soldiers with corrective glasses in the final level, implying that the military standard for conscription has dropped due to the heavy losses. And, above all, the Day of Wrath from Mozart's Requiem broadcasted through the speakers. The game is brimming with moments and details that give life to the immense movement of people and machines, that make the war seem alive. The frame is always packed with information, but the Commissar's speech truly stands out as one of the more ominous moments in this whole bloodbath and every sharp word of his paints the still life of their helpless despair. In the matter of days, an empire is going to shrink down into a building. Mechanics are the spine of the experience, the most concrete representation of this brutality, the spark at the meeting point of two sword edges. In World at War, brutality as a quality of combat is more dynamic, more responsive and more intimate and immediate than in any of the previous installments. Early World War II shooters are brilliant, but they offer a much more sanitized version of the war. That clean image and patriotic feel of the original games is nowhere to be seen in World at War. A bullet has visual consequences in this game. Combat often becomes a gallery of flagless flesh. Your progress in a mechanical sense produces animations of pain and suffering. That this game is something else entirely when it comes to the portrayal of combat is most obvious upon the raw visual comparison with other games. The sum of its aesthetic is the sediment of violence. Levels are larger, combat lasts longer and changes pace and style, so that these mechanics and the intensity of combat and war can be properly experienced. There's not a lot of examples of a gore system implemented in a way that's immersive and integrated into game's theme or story. History of gore in video games is mostly silly spectacle and a desensitizing caricature of reality. This is where I think the distinction lies. Darkness, Wolfenstein and Doom, they stylize violence as a part of their visual identity. It is an act of aesthetic exploitation that's at the core of the identity and legacy of the series. World at War integrates the gore system into the experience beyond mere style, but rather as an element that explores its central theme. This system brings an additional layer of brutality and adds depth on top of animations and vocalizations. I think this is one of the most mature implementations of a gore system into the gameplay, because it tones works with the rest of the game and doesn't feel like a technological gimmick. I find this memberment in the context of the Second World War to be ironically symbolic. It was far from a cleanest war ever that it's often portrayed to be. The myth of the clean Wehrmacht has been thoroughly debunked. Some of its upper echelon has even received hefty bribes from the Nazi party in order to participate in the extermination campaigns, and allies have committed often overlooked crimes that are horrifying. It is estimated that 100,000 women were raped in Berlin alone. That's the mud of history, and anyone not willing to accept simplified versions will eventually have to go through it. On a certain level, as most wars are, it was fought to preserve the establishment and their wealth. Somehow it seems that whenever there's an average Joe risking his life and limb, whenever there's an every man dying on a field somewhere, somebody somehow profits from it. But on a certain level, World War II was a clash of ideologies that asserted to be the final solution to the everlasting problem of the human future. And what's more, humanity's destiny itself. But the Nazi ideology had defined the groups of people that deserve or have the right to live and this ultimately made it a fight for the human as a unit of a society. The carrier of prosperity and happiness promised by the ideology. And to see the disrupted integrity of the human body, that vessel for beliefs and fears and hopes and intimacy and pain, is such a bitter image of the historic obscenity of the world that cannot move forward or change, resolve a conflict or create a better future without ripping the hands and legs of ordinary men, of past welders, bus drivers, teachers and bakers. If there is a glimpse of truth in this video, it's this. And other games have shown it, but World at War brings out the gruesome details of this colossal carnage. A Japanese trying to wipe the fire off his face, an American getting ripped by a grenade. These are representations of real people that lived and died at a point in time and now their bones are scattered somewhere in this old earth and their suffering has dissolved into a generalized idea of human tragedy. Easily forgotten, inconvenient to imagine in detail. There is a lesson here. I would go as far as to say that it would be immature and irresponsible to the history itself not to show the extent of suffering and consequences of an industrial war. This is not some fictitious conflict, it's human history. And not that anybody owns it any diligence, but still, if you want to portray the brutal conditions of combat, dismemberment is an aspect that should be represented. 
We grant a degree of sacredness to the body even in the secular era. We risk other lives and resources to recover the body from the sea, the jungle, from the guts of animals, from mass graves. It is a monument to life, a proof of it, a temple to store our personalities wherever their true fabric may be. More importantly, the body contains the face, the visual fingerprint in the memory, and to see it all ripped and blown is an act of desecration we grant unto ourselves. In the days of old, beheading was an act of final domination over the enemy in both a physical and symbolic way. Modern battlefields don't always offer an opportunity for such ceremonial cruelty, but they incorporate it at a wider scale as the very fabric of the war a physical consequence of its mechanization. Fingers that caress the hair of children blown into pieces. Legs that once enjoyed the thrill of a run ripped from the body. And faces, temples of emotion and expression blown into non-existence. Responsiveness to your violence through animation and vocalization is the essence of not just immersion, but anti-war sentiment as well. The more expressive the response is, the greater effect it leaves on the player. This is true at least in my case. I truly consider the sight of a mangled, twisted, shredded hand on the ground to be disturbing on an existential level. This war doesn't just kill people, it rips them apart. When I was younger I approached video games on a different level, and my playthroughs were motivated by exploration of the possibilities in these recreated worlds. Perhaps on my first playthrough the gore system of World at War was an interesting mechanic to be explored in its variety and complexity, to see how far they can push it just for the sake of it. Perhaps there was a time when games were escapism, and many things went past my excitement-occupied mind. When I play the game now, all this carnage tires me immensely, leaves no desire to explore it beyond its circumstantial emergence, and leaves a different impression altogether. Since the feedback for my actions is the same, the change has obviously happened inside of me. And it is not that I wish the game to be less violent, it's just that my reaction to this violence has become more contemplative. World War II still remains enough of a potent setting for me to ignore all this gore because it happened it's far from desensitizing and at times it's sickening There isn't a more subversive sight than that of a German or Japanese soldier screaming in agony with a raised arm that extends into a grim blossom of a destroyed hand. Both soldiers represent armies and ideologies that have caused systematic extermination. Still, this pain and suffering are utterly human in every sense, as universal as a smile. And I don't understand how an adult player could pass such a sight, especially when the animation was initiated by player's action, and not realize the thematic density behind this campaign. The core of the problem is this. It's not that you shouldn't fight them. Even more, it's not that they don't deserve death when standing to protect such vile vision of the future, but when they scream in agony, they speak the most human of languages. The chaotic battlefields of the world at war are so thematically dense. Every time a limb is torn, my mind knits a web of contemplative implications. This gore system isn't merely a texture or a severed limb. There is a gut-wrenchingly expressive animation triggered after the damage to support it. They chose to implement a combination of a fixed animation system and ragdolls. And this is ultimately far more intense and impactful, creating a fixed choreography behind the carnage. Seeing these performances of pain and suffering as a kid, I thought they must be exaggerated. War to me was merely a text in a history book at a time. Only now do I truly comprehend this gruesome portrayal. Soldiers of the Axis are actually humanized through the violence done to them. They're shown as humans capable of all too human suffering. Their twisted faces translate fear, their hands plead mercy. It's a universal language of suffering. There's a line of violence that once crossed abolishes any ideological prefix before suffering and leaves just the tragic sight of human pain. All gore animations are horrifyingly brutal. To see a person, whatever uniform they may wear, suffer so much, so expressively, is unsettling. I find the animation where a soldier loses both of his legs and wails for a moment before passing out to be particularly unnerving. There's another one where the entire arm and a portion of torso are ripped out, followed by a contorting animation that's just so disturbing. You can clearly see that this organism is slowly crossing the line between life and death, one twitch and gasp at a time. As we've seen in Far Cry 2, the fire mechanic isn't just about the visual fire effect itself. 
but about its consequences. In Far Cry, fire was mesmerizing in its unbound power to transform the scenery. In World at War, its effect is plain gruesome. You see the result and consequences of your action in all its vileness. When you stick a flamethrower into a tight tunnel and unleash a gush of flame out of its barrel, it is a crescendo of violence. Screaming enemies trying to wipe the flame off of their face as their skin and uniform become charred and blackened leaves little to imagination. This is not a suggestive game. It shoves the ugliness of war in your face. It offers an unfiltered view into the consequences of war. They went the lengths of making detailed unique skins for burn damage and the difference between a black decal and a separate model looks repulsive. The details in the damage are disgusting, and burning animations are particularly disturbing, as the avatar's expressiveness goes from extreme pain into numbness, or as they try to roll on the ground or wipe the flame off their face. It's visceral and brutal and still has the desired effect, even when compared to recent games such as Red Dead 2. In the chaos of combat, Last Stand is something you catch in the corner of your eye. Your focus is on those who are still a threat to you. But it is such an important addition to the collage of death and destruction. Firstly, because of how important the feedback is to any action, especially violence. Violence without proper feedback is mostly goofy and immature. Secondly, the extent to which this feedback represents the agony of the dying moment can be both a thematic and artistic element. World at War recycles the fixed dying animations and last stands from modern warfare, and they ultimately fit its themes and setting much better. Ultranationalism or international terrorism are serious topics, but when a dying German soldier pulls out of Walter under a leaden Berlin sky and manages to fire off a couple of shots, one-handed and barely aiming, it is a sight that embodies the essence of the mentality of the Nazi ideology during the final stages of the war, particularly this order from the defense plan of Berlin. The Reich capital will be defended to the last man and to the last bullet. It's challenging to reimagine the exact state of mind German soldiers were in. Their defeat was unstoppable. No amount of heroism or defiance towards facts would change this. There was no miracle around the corner. It was a fight that could end only one way. Dying and last stand animations help flesh out the hopelessness of their position. Dying soldiers sometimes produce the sound of gasping for air or drowning in their own blood. There's this one gurgling sound that gets under my skin every time. <coughs> In Pacific levels, setting is utilized beyond just atmosphere and level design. It serves a distinct thematic purpose by showing the maddening guerrilla warfare tactics and fanaticism of the Imperial Japanese Army. Enemies playing dead, lurking in the tall grass, waiting for you to pass their spider hole. Vicious ambushes, booby-trapped corpses, banzai charges and suicide pilots. All of this comes from the Pacific setting and creates a stark distinction between the two campaigns. This creates a dynamic where you're always suspicious of the tall grass and closely inspect each palm tree for a platform. The idea is to have the player's senses overwhelmed. You're aiming at something, but then you hear a charging cry above the cacophony of war, and your senses can be easily overflown with stimuli as the game demands attention in several parts of the screen. Banzai Charge is the embodiment of men versus men conflict in gameplay. All that combat and its political, ideological, and historic background reduced to the smallest, most basic element, two opposed forces of life. Amongst rocket strikes and special weapons, you ultimately have to face this deadly art of war with your avatar's two hands. The utter madness of a banzai or kamikaze attack as a phenomenon that emerges out of human psychology and sentience is a stunning mechanic to experience in first person. I feel like an enormous instantaneous transformation happens in that moment, where you're stripped of all your identities and loyalties and remain just an organism with a singular purpose of survival. Playing this game gives you a sense of how traumatizing it must have been for people to experience this. With such intimidating enemy AI and the necessity of your awareness and response, this game manages to touch upon something of the psychology of war and translate it into gameplay mechanically and aesthetically. The Avatar in Call of Duty 2 has the pristine-looking hands of an office clerk, despite going through the beaches of Normandy, deserts of El Alamein and rubbles of Stalingrad. This doesn't feel particularly immersive. Initially, there were barely any hands showing under the gun. Then there were models without much detail. And although there are early examples of hand models that imply a story or at least personify the character, the genre had eventually settled for generic hands for quite some time. 
clean blank hands with no stories to tell. But there were always more detailed models that supported characters' role in the story, showing that hands aren't just an inconvenience of realism but can be visual storytelling devices. The original Call of Duty featured hands that had one noticeable feature, bruised knuckles. This was perhaps the first instance of war reflected on Avatar's hands. History Channel's A Nation Divided features an avatar with appropriately bloodied wrists and knuckles. In Call of Juarez, the mad preacher Ray McCall had one of the ugliest looking finger nails I've ever seen, while the other playable character, Billy, has clean hands, a distinctive detail about personal hygiene. From Wolfenstein to Battlefield 5, amongst all the dirty fingernails, bruised knuckles, wedding rings and blood decals, it's clear that somebody thought it's important how the hands themselves look and cared to include those details. But few hands at the time had as much detail as the pair from World at War. Dirt is deeply rooted in the nail folds, knuckles are bruised, wounds are crusted with blood, there's a crescent of dirt under each fingernail and a nasty scratch across the middle tendon. Patches of grime cover the palms, absorbed into the pores and wrinkles of the skin. Skin. The conditions of war are reflected on the surface of characters' hands. They are consistent with everything that's around you and everything that the game is about. You could predict all sorts of grim days ahead from reading those poems. What an ominous act of palmistry that would be. Hands are such a visually distinctive and relatable symbol of effort and strife and shooters have them in the forefront for the majority of the experience. They can tell much more complex stories than they are entrusted with and are the most intimate embodiment and personification of the character. And in World at War they are there to always remind you of the general condition of the avatar. Through Petrenko's hands we see a visual summary of his journey as well as of the war itself. From the fountain of death in Stalingrad, through the outskirts of Berlin where tables have turned, towards the very top of the Reichstag. And the same goes for Miller, from putting on a helmet and taking that officer's Nambu from Sullivan, through the jungles and ambushes and all the grunt work, to a somber victory. Hands are faces in this game. World at War is a game with mostly realistic art direction, but in deconstructing the look of war in this game it seems to me that there is something else just beyond the attempt at pure visual fidelity, a whiff of artistic direction that ultimately creates a unique and impressionistic look. This look supports the atmosphere of horrific destruction and helical conditions within an indifferent nature and ravaged cities, and even offers a glimpse of that immense darkness devouring life itself. I find these four elements to be particularly defining of the art direction and thematic exploration. Use of colors, particles giving a sense of texture to the frame, bloomy lightning from the sun and warm lightning from the burning fires. Their cumulative effect is the essence of the art style for me. The quality of color is what's particularly responsible for the atmosphere. Color palette is deliberately oppressive with its ashen, mossy texture. What's especially noteworthy is how color is used to embody the emotion of a particular scene. In Little Resistance, the contrast is stunning as you cross the shadow line in what feels like a metaphorical birth into the world that holds countless possibilities of your death. The enshrined metallic entails of the ship dissolve into the muted colors that radiate warmth and dry air. Colors feel like dying embers of their full potential brightness. A skybox in Vendetta feels as if it's made out of lead and the whole screen has this sickly impersonal grey-blue filter out of which a pool of dark red blood and burning fires barely stick out. The same effect is mirrored in Berlin levels where the air has the color of corroded chrome and the sky is dirty silver. Clouds of black smoke dissolve into this palette of gloom and further oppress the whole screen. It's visually aggressive, it attacks your eyes. At the end of Relentless you are faced with a magnificent sight of a dark blue ocean and a light blue sky. Hope radiated through color. Modern Warfare had moments where radical states or conditions of the environment were represented through stark filters and intense colors. World at War implements this to further immerse you into its world. In their land, their blood, as you move through the trenches into the burning forest, the air of ashes dominates the screen and covers your whole perspective including the hands and the gun. It feels intensely oppressive, as if the ash had gotten into the avatar's eyes. Small orange embers glow through the air poetically. In Blowtorch and Corkscrew every firearm featured in the level has a unique skin that includes a wet gloss and raindrops on its surface. Raindrops give different texture to the metal and wood, and when you face the sun the wet surface produces a unique variant of the glare. These details don't just immerse me into the visual reality of the game, expecting ashes where there's fire and raindrops where there's rain, but into its portrayal of war itself. One of the reasons certain levels look so unique and distinctive is the way they were lit. 
Lamps and fires add texture and a specific patina to the gutted apartments of Berlin. Scenes, faces, uniforms, colors lit by the in-game fire are given an aura of otherworldliness in this world of carnage. Pay close attention to Reznov's whole persona in this moment. It looks like a beautiful painting coming alive, a saint of war. As soon as he gets into the train, the magic play of light is gone. This is particularly noticeable once you enter Berlin. Flames slowly devouring bits and pieces of the Nazi empire light the way forward. Destroyed apartment buildings lit by open flame feel like a setting for some fictional apocalypse. Fire transforms every scene and gives character to everything upon which it casts its light. There's not much light in this game, as you crawl through jungles and fight through smoke-covered skies, but when there is, it's blinding. In Pacific levels, an intense bloom is radiated from the sun, enveloping parts of the sky. This bloom dulls the edges of things, giving them a deceptively angelic outline. You don't actually see the fireball of the sun, but when you look up, a burning pool of light spreads out of the clouds. A patch of sky becomes a smudge of blinding light. That glare of the indifferent sun follows your every step. In their land, their blood, as you progress through the forest, sun glares beyond the treetops as if there is an invisible fire threatening to devour all. But in Berlin you feel its absence. The skybox is dense with the sky texture, smoke effects and particles, and behind all those layers there's a shy sun radiating some dim afternoon light. Once you charge the plateau of the parliament building, sun is barely to be seen. It shies away behind the ugly clouds and thick columns of smoke. The aesthetic experience of playing this game is such an oppressive one to the senses. Such art style creates a strong visual identity that fits the overall aesthetic of the game and its themes. And this dirty look is truly fitting for this brutal portrayal of war. Another level of immersion into the brutal conditions of war was brought through sound design, particularly the implementation of two new technologies, sound occlusion and flux. Occlusion alters the original sound depending on objects blocking its path, determining the level to which the original sound is muffled by the time it reaches the player. Thanks to this you can determine the distance of a gunshot. Flux system determines the way a sound echoes through space, so that you can establish the general direction of a gunshot. When on top of bleak and gruesome visuals, you pack the sounds of detonation, firing mechanisms, war cries and screams into these two systems, you have a game that hijacks another sense of yours with its brutality. This is why World at War is at times truly helical. Sounds and visual feedback blend into an experience of horror as explosions go off, pieces of flesh fly around and screams rise above the battleground. Most tracks are structured in a way that they start with impactful and implicative sounds and as the mission progresses into chaos, guitar riffs and more experimental stuff kicks in. And this model works up to the point you start to get the sense you're playing Doom or Wolfenstein. Hard rock riffs in this game didn't really work for me and felt tone deaf and inappropriate, historically and aesthetically. But the intros with their progressive evolving into ominous melodies that don't just fit the gameplay perfectly, but crawl under your skin and amplify the effect of oppressive visuals truly fit the rest of the game. These pieces of the soundtrack are integrated into the gameplay to the point where you feel like it's coming from the world itself, somewhere from that overbearing sky. Intros feature more classical and traditional elements, such as violins and choirs, while the combat music is made out of the guitar riffs and electronica, with a style of their own. It could be argued that this industrial sounding music that envelops the senses at a certain point is there to represent the intensity of violence you're subjected to, in a sense that the music follows the progression through the spectrum of violence. Through the soundscape, beauty degrades into brutality, literally, and I think that's a valid argument from the standpoint of aesthetic experience, but I simply find the hard rock aspect on Necessary. Different segments of the level's soundtrack are triggered by your progress, and it creates a sense of responsive and dynamic rhythm of war. Little Resistance is a good example of how the emotional feedback from the game is supported by the soundtrack. Landing segment itself has four distinct pieces of the soundtrack. The glorifying orchestral piece once the landing craft touches the water. It is the most stereotypical perception of the combat of the Second World War embodied in music. It's grandiose and promises glory. As things start to go to hell, soundtrack evolves into an ominous segment with a flute and strings, and then into a beautiful vocalization, an angelic intro to hell. Then it evolves into a faster paced orchestral piece and once the tension of the scene explodes into Miller's near-death experience, it goes back back into the angelic solo that disintegrates into mangled echoes. Once Sullivan pulls you out of the water, it's a completely new soundtrack, promising you've seen nothing of the war yet. 
This chilling music follows you through the trench, through the consequences of your action and once you face the first wave of enemies, the proper action music starts and it evolves into a doom soundtrack once you reach the trenches. This is just one example of a possible complexity. These oscillations of rhythm and emotion happen throughout levels. This is definitely interesting but it doesn't always hit the mark. Another notable example is the soundtrack to Downfall and I recommend you try playing that level with only music on. One particularly interesting quality of the soundtrack for Pacific levels is that many music pieces carry a form of conflict within themselves, contrasting classical military brass sections with traditional Japanese shakuhachi flute and taiko drums. These musical collages of folk, orchestral and electronic music give the soundtrack a unique flavor. It's definitely interesting and unlike anything I've heard before, it's just that it doesn't always work with the rest of the game. The choice to include hard rock guitar riffs comes off as tone deaf no matter how you look at it. This isn't due or Mafia 3 and levels that juxtapose distorted guitars and carnage feel really off to me. The same goes for that shriveled scream that cries out die each time the avatar gets killed. It feels a bit experimental and avant-garde and doesn't really fit the grounded approach of the rest of the game. But Treyarch tends to experiment more in general and experimentation doesn't always hit the mark. Perhaps some of the energy from Zombies segment was overflowing to the campaign. Some of the tracks feel like they were composed for a modern action thriller. But still, there are a lot of moments that that paired the sound and the scene brilliantly, like the mystery and tension of a booby-trapped plane or the angelic personification of death and vendetta. But you can play the game with music turned off completely and it works. Sounds of the environment and combat are more than enough to substantiate the experience of war on their own. These are Chernov's first words, this is how his character is introduced to us. And the conflict between his and Reznov's worldview is established immediately. His mercy is the opposing standpoint to Reznov's mercilessness. Reznov's cruelty is balanced out with Chernov's compassion. It is the most basic dramatic principle of two opposing forces creating a conflict. Chernov makes a distinction between war and murder, and it is left to the players to decide if they care about this distinction in these particular circumstances. The final conflict between Chernov and Reznov shows how their storylines have matured. Reznov still peddles patriotism and glory while Chernov's face bears an immense tiredness. You have a chance to see what a thousand yard stare looks like in-game. Reznov is unrestrained in his scolding and mocks Chernov's contemplativeness and gentler nature. This obviously isn't some complex character study, but it's rather commendable when you consider that Chernov has a dozen or so lines throughout the whole game and I feel like his character has been left unexamined for some reason, when in fact it is his performance that brings a truly subversive look at violence, both the real violence and its gamified representation. And his death finally softens Reznov's heart a bit, so perhaps his words meant something after all, even to the old man. This theme of the duality of the human nature blends in brilliantly with the setting and its brutality. To Reznov bringing the beast that is the Nazi Germany to its knees through the acts of individual killing, extinguishing life after life is a joyous act which he elevates to the status of poetry. To Chernov this is just something that has to be done but he finds no joy in it and constantly questions the cruelty that scars the souls of those pulling triggers. This line is memorable in particular. Sergeant Reznov, you seem to relish in the slaughter. It's a portrayal of a tender soul in war, and this personal conflict is the bitter cherry on the cake in this game, that thing that closes the whole circle of World at War as an aesthetic experience. You're given a setting and mechanics to interact with, but this moral conflict completes the experience. His existence turns into a spectrum what would otherwise be one-dimensional violence. He's there to challenge the player, not on a mechanical level as is the case in Fallout or Dishonored, but on a philosophical one. He doesn't challenge you to change your playstyle, he challenges you to examine how you relate to the consequences of your playstyle. Regardless of how radical both Chernov's and Reznov's positions are, and how cartoonishly shallow Reznov can be in his stereotypical Russianness, they at least have character. Prior to this we've only seen shells of personality, implications that there was more behind the voice, but never this developed. This conflict between him and Reznov was a new thing in the Call of Duty series and added a new dimension to the experience. The series went on with variations of badasses but the character of Chernov is something games depicting war need more of. In the spirit of the rawness of the experience you're given a very limited and seemingly inconsequential choice in how you relate to the brutality around you. But at the heart of this conflict there is a legacy of sorts, brief and fleeting and aimed entirely at the player. And when you make your choices nothing indicates an existence 
existence of a morality system, outside of the in-game conflict between Reznov and Chernov and players' own feelings. And in the end, there isn't any judgement. It's just a couple of sentences of how you were perceived by Chernov. And this system really works in the context of the closing days of war. Because besides the player and the character of Chernov, there is no in-game judgement for any of your actions. Just like mass executions and rape went unpunished in real life. And instead of an individual judgement, there is only a historic one. Perpetrators went on with their lives. Sergeant Sullivan is the archetypal fatherly authority, with a look that contains far more than the scenery itself. He looks like he probably considers each man in his squad to be his son. Roebuck is the subversion of that fatherly figure. Compared to Sullivan's, his face is disfigured with a collection of nasty scars. This guy is far from the idealized propaganda poster image of the prototype of the American hero, with a clear shaven face and a victorious smile. The way he talks, the way he addresses his men, everything about him is unconventional. He stands out among the whole history of World War II characters. He is the product of war. Machete on his back, scarred head and cheeks. They imply he has an intimate history with violence and make him stand out. His face is the face of war, deformed by combat. This is the face he's supposed to bring back to his wife and kids and bear the very war itself on his face when he goes to church or has a beer in a local bar. Every time he stands before a mirror he's supposed to see a postcard of the Pacific. Roebuck is portrayed as a pessimist who gets the job done with a weary look on his face. There's this notion all throughout his dialogues that he's really tired from all the war around him, but his body just keeps on going, keeps fighting it. In a long line of heroes who just get the job done, he is the one who sighs about it. There are moments in World at War that contain in themselves the very essence of the game. A small dose of its aesthetic identity. Both campaigns contain these aesthetic extracts of the experience. This was possible mainly because of how tightly packed and consistent the game is. The scene of enemy's body obscuring the sun over the avatar is one example. All around you and even across the globe, the war goes on. But in that spark of a moment, you play the ultimate game of life and death. This scene is as much of a war as this one. Fail animation has Miller desperately grabbing the end of a rifle for a second. Raw life clinging in reflex to the very thing that's extinguishing it. Moment of death is expressed through the animation of an opening palm dropping the K-bar knife. Miller's own extension of the will to live and its capacity for violence. How poetic. If you deflect the bayonet into the ground beside your face, Miller stabs the knife into the attacker's neck. The wide open mouth of his war cry merge into the clenched teeth of his death face. The way light of the sun pours over the edges of his body is strangely beautiful. If you're facing the sun, out of that blinding bloom of the sky, a circle of intense light shines over the shoulder as he becomes a corpse. You push it to the side to reclaim the sunlight once more, but little good it does since this light only reveals more carnage. Another example is the moment you reload the trench gun after producing a cloud of blood in giblets in front of you. That combination of the sound of the shot itself and projectiles muffled by flesh, together with pumping action. Action. And I'm referencing the reload with aiming in particular, since that way you see more of the gun. The hammer dropping down and breech bolt going out. There's also that moment you unleash a gush of fire from a flint rower inside a narrow bunker. The pressure release from the nozzle sounds like a tired breath of an old dragon. The isolated act of lightning a Molotov cocktail and setting fields of wheat on fire on the outskirts of Berlin. Reloading a double barrel shotgun after unleashing a storm of pellets inside a kitchen of a devastated apartment. Here you have all those elements I've analyzed merged together into a tightly packed experience of the very essence of the game's aesthetic. Those damaged hands holding a knife, a bottle, a lighter, enemy's facial expression, sound design around you, setting itself, its overbearing skies, dying animations, fire effects, blood splatter. These elements streamlined into an intense and isolated snippet of the experience result in moments that holistically constitute the aesthetic essence of the whole game. It feels like the design makes a full circle with these moments. As the experience settles in my mind and is integrated into my memory, I can't help but think of that ominous quote from Blood Meridian, when Judge says, It makes no difference what men think of war. War endures. As well ask men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was, war waited for him. The ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. If there is an event that justifies such evil sophistry, it's the Second World War. The idea behind the aesthetic series is to isolate individual elements of the design and then see them as parts of a larger entity. 
that moving bigger picture is the aesthetic experience. And once I'm immersed into this game, once those imposing skies encapsulate my immersion and soldiers drop on their knees still squeezing the trigger tight in a dying spasm and gurgle as they lay on the ground or hold their wounds, the scale of senseless death animalistic violence, burnt flags, buildings ripped open, flames devouring wooden columns, raindrops on the wristwatch, coat of paint peeling off of the flamethrower, distant lightning, scratched metal, dirty bandages across the face of an SS soldier, and classical music broadcasted through speakers in a desperate attempt to boost the German morale. All of this implies a broader vision behind development, a vision of a brutal war, and a glimpse of an immense darkness looming beyond it. The power of people liking a game isn't necessarily measured in the number of spiritual successors published. That's why cult followings exist. World at War is a game with almost no surviving legacy in the industry outside of the Black Ops sequel. It's stuck between two worlds in a way that's hard to define in terms of its relation to the history of the series and the genre. It is defiantly not a classic shooter. It's too different apart from the mechanical skeleton. It is modern in a sense that it actually explores a theme through its gameplay and feels rather mature, but it it was ultimately pushed aside by the modern warfare concept. Modern shooter came to be defined through dominant forms of movement and futuristic firearms and gadgets, so it doesn't really fit in with what came after either. It remains in the middle of the genre, not quite like the original games and completely different from both modern shooters and the reboots. Modern Warfare and World at War offered two takes on the old Call of Duty formula, and everyone chose to imitate the first one. Even Black Ops essentially aspires to be the best competitor to Modern Warfare. It feels like World at War had started and ended something at the same time. A one kind of a game that somebody had misplaced in the changing landscape of shooters. As if it's a trend onto itself. Hell's Highway at least closes the legacy of its own series. Released less than a month after Far Cry 2, it feels like a part of a very brief zeitgeist in the gaming world. An answer to more casual video games. Not just an edgy alternative to entertainment and fun, but an example of an experience created through the cohesion between teams and gameplay. Notice how they both had rudimentary stories, created raw experiences using mechanics instead of cutscenes, and explored archetypal themes through immersion, and had much less of that gamey feel. But while Far Cry 2 still has a rather present legacy, both inside and outside of its own series, World at War remains a truly forgotten game, a game without legacy. This adds additional value in my opinion, since you can't experience anything quite like it anywhere else. Black Ops and Modern Warfare went on competing who can stylize the action and narrative more. Battlefield reboots went their own way, and Red Orchestra hell let loose and post-scriptum are multiplayer only experiences. To this day there is nothing out there quite like World at War. And yet it is obvious that World at War doesn't reach the depths of the masterpieces such as the Tin Red Line or Come and See, but it sets a standard when it comes to the depiction of war in video games. Every day around 300 World War II veterans die in the USA. The numbers probably aren't much different across the globe. In the next 20 years most of the people born during the war will die. With each of them buried, the human species is closer to losing the living memory of the most destructive and fatal conflict in human history. In 20 years it will be just photographs, footage and memoirs, together with history and art. And despite our concept of time, actual memory of combat will be as distant to us as the memory of the very first war ever fought. We will lose all original sources. Rakhimzan Koshkarbaev, who was the first to plant the Soviet flag in the crown of the bronze giantess of Germania on top of the Reichstag, in the fateful night of April 30th, die on 10th of August 1988. With him he has taken to the grave quite a unique feeling, and one magnificent sight. The photo couldn't be taken during the night and the flag was taken down by Germans. The act itself would later be reenacted with different soldiers into the iconic photograph, but Koshkarbaev took that real moment to his grave. On a more personal note and with a somber tone, I remember my grandfather reminiscing about how he and his brother approached an army that liberated their village, and even got a plate of army chow from the cook, and just sat there eating it, devouring those nameless soldiers with their admiring eyes. And my grandmother portraying this scene of dead cattle on a field after an air raid, 
a scared child too young to make a connection between sound in the sky and the glossy eyes of dead animals. Those memories will remain merely stories and who knows how much is going to be lost in that transmutation. When I wrote this passage I thought it was complete, but a couple of days later I came to experience that bitter feeling of regretting I didn't visit at least one more time, to hear another piece of wisdom and biography, to steal another tale of memory. One of my grandfathers had passed away. Those words I wrote rang an octave truer. I think that video games have an enormous potential for exploring the war as an anthropological phenomenon. And to this day that potential remains largely unexplored. And I often have this impression that perhaps this interactive format could create representations of war more faithful, more memorable and perhaps even insightful than any other medium available. This notion however remains unconfirmed an optimistic ambition. While waiting for it, I find that World at War offers something of war that no other video game does. 